Welcome to the Bombay Bar Association podcast, where we share the rich history of the Bombay Bar Association through our wonderful members, past and present. Today, we have retired Justice Sujata Manohar with us. Justice Manohar has a unique distinction of being the first woman from our bar to be elevated as a judge of the Bombay High Court. She is the first woman Chief Justice of both the Bombay and Kerala High Courts, as well as only the second woman to become a judge of the Supreme Court of India. Her distinguished career has been a source of inspiration for so many of us. Join me as Justice Manohar shares many highlights, challenges, along with some heartfelt anecdotes from her time as a lawyer and as a judge. Welcome, Mrs. Sujata Manohar. Thank you. Before I delve into all questions regarding your practice at the bar, your judgeship, etc., I think you are one of the lucky few at the age of 12 years saw India's independence. How was it? Oh, it was very exciting. And of course, we youngsters in those days were very thrilled that finally we were going to be independent. And our families decided that uh, we will hire a truck and go to the city and see the lights of Independence Day. And I saw the Indian flag being uh, flown from the Central Court of the Bombay High Court. At midnight, we were all in the Central Court to watch that ceremony. So that was quite something. You know, the public balconies ha, ha, ha. in those days were not that unsafe, so we could all go <laughs> there. <laughs> Mrs. Manor, when did you thought for the first time that you are getting into law? I don't know. It was sort of predetermined because uh, it was assumed that I was going to do law. We have a family tradition that the one child takes law and the other child takes medicine. So because my father was a lawyer, it was assumed that as the eldest child, I would do law. So it was just assumed. And I was quite pleased about it because my mother had told me stories about Mrs. Mita Lam, who was then a woman lawyer in those days, yes. and how good she was. So I had decided that I would do even better than that. And my ambition had always been to be a very good lawyer. You studied philosophy, economics, and politics in Oxford. What was the atmosphere like during that time? First of all, in my time, Oxford had women's colleges, separate from men's colleges. And that was because you stayed in the college. Even today, you stay in the college. So uh, when I went to a women's college, I thought I had gone back a couple of centuries. <laughs> 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 but the lectures are common to everybody. They are university lectures. And we mainly learn uh, by uh, arguing with, so to speak, or exchanging thoughts with our tutors. Mm -hmm. We have individual sessions with tutors. So that's a very different way of learning. Uh, you're quoting somebody is not something very special. You have to say what you want to say. So that is a very basic difference in the attitude towards learning. So you learn to learn on your own. I think uh, while you are in Oxford, your father, Justice Katie Desai, was being offered judgeship. Did he write any letter to you and gave you some advice or? <laughs> no, he wrote to me uh, when he accepted judgeship, saying that now that I'm becoming a judge, well, I won't be able to help you in your career as a lawyer. So I told him not to worry. It's all right. I, I, and then when I came back and started practice, I, he told me a couple of things which I think everybody should follow even now, but nobody does. And first thing was, he said, you write out all the pleadings by hand. Now, <laughs> that today is impossible. But the idea was that that makes what you say precise and short. And the second thing he said was that before you draft anything, please look up all the authorities so that you put all your legal submissions 
and frame them uh, so that your cause of action reflects what the law says. I think those are the two things he told me, and they have always stood me in good stead, even in writing judgments. I remember Piyush Amin huh. when I was at the bar, and uh, we always used to look at him because he used to write all his pleadings with pencil in That's hand. Right. In fact, he had he had given me some uh, precedents of. Uh, Pleadings by Motilal Settleward, oh. one by C.K. Daftar, he was there. Three pages, four pages. <laughs> now, it is impossible I'm getting... to. <laughs> <laughs> I remember while in Supreme Court, you were sitting with Justice Verma, hmm. and I was appearing in a matter before you. It was a Bombay matter, and some bank suit pleadings. And Justice Verma picked up that bundle, which was in two volumes at that time. And he put it like this and he said, this must be Bombay matter. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what the reputation of Bombay pleading probably now, by then. Oh dear. Mrs. Manor, what was your first brief? And do you remember what happened? Before whom did you appear? Yes, of course I remember. So as a token of goodwill, I got a brief to appear before Chief Justice Chagla. Of course, it was only to take a consent decree. But still, it was nice. So I yeah. appeared before him. That was my first brief. After that, to get a second brief was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like for you to be a maybe only woman or among the very few women who were practicing law at that time? So how was the atmosphere in the library? Uh, the atmosphere was quite friendly. You know, on the first day when I joined the bar, uh, one of the solicitors who is no, who was then known as a poet came and gave me uh, his booklet of poems. And, and then another senior lawyer came to me and seriously said, why have you come here? I, have you come here to get a husband? So, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I have actually come here to practice. So he was quite surprised. He said, all right. So it was like that. And there were four or five women lawyers in the high court hmm. library in those days. Okay. And I don't think anybody had much work. So it was not uh, very encouraging. But it was also a challenge. So that you have to find your way through this. And you did uh, accept that challenge and come out with flying colors, one would say. Uh, we heard that there was a table known as 10 Downing Street. And what was <laughs> that? Can you tell all of our uh, viewers about what is this 10 Downing Street doing here in Bombay High Court? <laughs> you see, that was the table uh, where we... Uh, met for lunch. The Bar Association, as you know, has long tables. Yeah, in our lobby. number of people sit. And we had a table from which I think a large number of judges were ultimately appointed. And that is why it was called number 10 down the street. Okay. <laughs> we had Mukhi sitting there and just, just, uh, Jim Gandhi Jim. was there. The various people were there. You had a family life while hmm. you were practicing as a lawyer. Sangeeta Rajesh Anish, and of course, Vasan by your better half. You took care of the family. How was it to balance your work and uh, family life? Oh, that was the first thing you have to learn how to allot your time. And the importance of them, that is what my husband taught me. Because when my first Anish was born, my first child, I told him, how can I go to court and leave him alone at home? I had a very nice ayah, but there was nobody else. So then he told me that, well, you can come home during the court recess and look at the child and be sure that he's okay and go back. I've done that for 10 years. Wow. And that has given me confidence. Well, you can look after small children also and do this. Then later on, when uh, I felt that uh, in spite of spending so much time and so much effort, I was not getting enough work, I told him that I think I should give up. It's too much. 
It's very difficult. So he said, no, don't do that. Uh, as a woman, how much handicap are you willing to give yourself? He's a golfer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, well, I can give myself five years handicap. So I said, okay. So he said, you look at yourself. And if you are doing as well as a good junior, five years your junior is doing, then you are okay. Then you continue, otherwise you give up. And that has been a good test for me. The, those were the tests which made me continue, although I was very unhappy about the kind of work, work I was getting. getting. And, Mrs. Manod, uh, you practice on original side. A lot of commercial litigation. Mm. But besides that, I believe you did a lot of family matters, a lot of pro bono work you were doing, even before we have this Legal Services Authority. Can you tell us about the work which you did? I had a lot of spare time. You know, it was difficult to get work. And I thought that there are so many people, especially women, who need some legal guidance, but who have no access to legal services. They can't afford it. So I thought I can help them. And so I asked uh, women's organizations if they have any women who need legal help, I would be there to help them out. They can refer them to me. Uh, it started with my being on the uh, Maharashtra State Women's Council. I was the chairman of their parliamentary committee and we started a legal aid cell for women who came to the society for help. This was much before the legal aids mm. uh, became a government, government. Uh, service. So that is how it started. Then many other women's organizations also approached me because there were no women lawyers mm. to help. And most of them had family disputes or oh. family problems. They can and, confide in you and, and uh, they can find, uh, find out what advice, is to be correct. done, how to go about it and mm. so on. So in 1978, January, you were appointed as a judge of Bombay High Court. What was your first day in court as a judge? What was the reaction of the family, the society? Well, before sitting on the bench, uh, Justice Kantawala, who was then the Chief Justice, had asked me, would you like to sit on this bench or the other bench? So I chose uh, a bench with Justice Deshpande, which was hearing appeals, because I had not appeared in appellate side appeals. So I thought I will sit with him and learn a little bit about that. So we sat together. And one of the first cases which came before us was about an appeal from a city civil court order granting maintenance to the woman. And apparently uh, the judge had followed the old formula of one-fifth of the husband's income as her maintenance, which came to a very small amount. So I told Justice Deshpande, I think this is not right because husband is a businessman and it's very easy to conceal your income. Uh, so let us see the way in which they live, their lifestyle. And depending on that, we can see that she should get a maintenance which is consistent with the lifestyle in which they live. And that was the first judgment uh, which was given when I sat on the bench. And that was Justice Deshwanda's judgment, that is okay. reported judgment. Uh -huh. And uh, which lays down that it's not just one-fifth of the income, but you can also take into account other circumstances yeah. to decide maintenance. In 1994, when you became Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, mm -hmm. I think Bombay was undergoing a very challenging period with the riots that have taken place just then. What was that? What was that like? And uh, I believe that uh, government asked you to nominate a judge for the inquiry commission. So, can you tell us something about that? Uh, I was then the acting Chief Justice. Okay. I had not become the Chief Justice, but Justice Mukherjee was on leave and he had gone to Calcutta. So uh, I thought that the best person who would look at the situation impartially and give a proper report would be Justice Shri Krishna. But then I heard that 
they wanted somebody who was neither a Hindu nor a Muslim. And we had some judges who were either Parsis or Christians, and they wanted to be appointed. And some articles appeared in newspapers to oh. say that how you should have a judge who is not Hindu or Muslim to do all this. So I, I didn't like that at all. I I said a judge is a judge. And why should you say that because he's a Hindu, he will hold in favor of a Hindu? He's not a proper judge, if that is so. So I asked Justice Sri Krishna whether he would become uh, accept the commission of inquiry. And I consulted, of course, uh, Justice Mukherjee, who was then on leave, saying, I want to appoint so-and-so. Would he agree? And he said, yes, of course, you go ahead. So that is how I appointed Justice Sri Krishna. Ah. And we have the famous Sri Krishna report, Commission report. Report there. on that, yeah. Hmm. So thereafter, uh, you were Chief Justice of Kerala High Court. Hmm. What was that Kerala time which you spent in Kerala High Court? How was it? Of course, it's a very different High Court from Bombay. But the judges uh, the, uh, were very courteous and helpful. The bar is also very respectful. If you listen to what they have to say and reply to them correctly, they will not agitate. Uh, contrary to what is thought of, they were very reasonable in many ways. Mrs. Manohar, as a judge, you have never shied away with any responsibility. You have not shocked any responsibility from taking a stand. So we understand that there's a Priti Srivastava case which is concerning reservation. Was there any pressure mounted on judges? No, there was no pressure at all, I must say. Um, we had to decide uh, and uh, I thought that at the highest level, you cannot have reservation. Because basically reservation means that you strike a balance between equality and giving equal rights to all and giving support to those who, who are backward and who need to come forward. So there is a conflict of law rights which you have to balance. And you have to apply the proportionality principle. And if you do that, then up to a point, you can have reservations to help people who have been discriminated against. But at the highest level, well, you require maximum amount of competence. You can't have reservation. So the Preeti Srivastava judgment is about that. Uh, of course, there was opposition to the judgment after I delivered it. What was the pressure like to see your effigies burn? And uh, how do you deal with such uh, Nothing, only you have to tensions. ignore it. You have to do what is right. Yeah. The courts in India have played a pivotal role in progressively moving culture forward, be it a question of triple talaq, decriminalization of homosexuality, or more recently, settling the matter of privacy is a fundamental right. You too were part of a bench at that time which progressively wanted to protect women in workplaces. So Vishakha judgment, which is very famous now, how that matter arose and can you tell us something about that? Because we understand that the facts of that case had nothing to do with uh, ultimate guidelines which you laid down. You see, the woman social worker who was employed, she was to uh, monitor child marriages in the state of Rajasthan. Oh. And she stopped one child marriage, as a result of which the locals were very annoyed with her and she was raped. And there was a criminal trial which was going on. But the NGO which brought the matter said that well, we can't interfere while the criminal trial is going on. But in the meanwhile, why should social workers who are doing work of public interest be harassed like this and threatened? And so they came asking for orders to stop this kind of treatment of social workers. So that is how it started. And then it 
uh, we had very good lawyers appearing before us. We had Fali Dariban, I think, and Temta Dandhya Rujita. Okay. And they were very cooperative. And the NGO was also very well in informed. So we then we decided that in that case, we will frame proper guidelines because there are no guidelines. Uh, in such cases, what can you do to stop this kind of events from occurring? And if they occur, what do you do about them and how do you treat the culprits? So that is how it, the exercise of framing guidelines began. And ultimately, we laid down guidelines and said that these will operate until a proper law is framed. Post-retirement, uh, I believe you are part of the National uh, Human Rights uh, Commission. How was that experience? Oh, that was different, but also very rewarding as satisfying as a judgeship also in some ways because uh, I was the focal point on trafficking and issues relating to women and children as also HIV AIDS. So now here you talked about Vishakha. Now Justice Verma was the chairman and I was there and we were asked to implement the Vishakha guidelines because there were many so governments <laughs> in the Human Rights Commission because many uh, state uh, or government departments had not constituted committees as we had asked. So we had to have several conferences with all these senior officials and with great difficulty, we persuaded most of them to set up committees. So that yeah. was a rather an unusual experience <laughs> at the direction of the Supreme Court. The other main thing was that I was looking at various issues relating to trafficking of women and children. And I found that we had absolutely no material on the subject as to what was happening in India. So we decided to have a research, an action research on this. We got finances from UNIFEM. They supported us. And we got help of Institute of Social Science, Delhi. And we had 11 NGOs working in different parts of the country in, the, in this area. And between them, they interviewed over 4,000 persons oh. in different areas as to what was happening. We located areas from where mostly women and children were trafficked, why they were more susceptible to trafficking in those areas than others, where they were trafficked to, and what was the financial gain, how these people were treated by the courts, when they were produced before the courts. And some of the NGOs even managed to interview the traffickers. Mm -hmm. So we have brought out this research book, which is a, one of its kind. I have not come across any other book of this kind from any other country. And this was a consultation paper which you had given to United Nations. That's right. As a result, they invited me and I had given a consultation paper on that. You must have... As a NHRC commission member, must have heard some gruesome stories about some women and child trafficking and all sorts of things. Most of the complaints are about police not registering FIRs, other complaints saying not proper investigation, things like that. Yeah. And so uh, we would, uh, those were, you can take action on that and see that things are registered and so on. There were also a lot of complaints about uh, police just ignoring complaints which were about human rights violations of some kind or the other. And we had big programs in those days to see if police can be sensitized to yeah. all these human rights issues and they must learn how to investigate, because the problem is that there, nobody teaches them how to investigate. And that is a big drawback as far as criminal trials are concerned. And we also found uh, that the number of under trials in jails was I mean, tremendous. More. I think their majority are under trials. And why should they be in jail? And 
the excuse normally given is said, well, we don't have enough police vans to take them to court and all kinds of things. So we, uh, we started, told them that let uh, we should have courts in the in the in jail. the prison itself in the jail jail itself. And you look at those petty thieves like some pickpockets and somebody who is traveling without a ticket and things like that. They can you can release them. There were statistics that there are people in prison without trial. Yes, and they have already undergone prison terms, which is even. Uh, Less than uh, the sentence that could be awarded if they are convicted. I know. You must have somebody to look at it. So I think Human Rights Commission is a good place where you can go and ask for relief. You have been a judge for about 20 years. And during this entire career of yours, you must have come across several matters where people narrate to them their stories. And I'm sure it must have affected... Uh, you when you go home so I think mentally one has to be very strong in order to deal with all these kind of stories no, I think as a judge you learn even as a lawyer you learn to be one step uh, away from what you are listening to you should not identify yourself with what the story is told before you because in order to judge properly also, you have to be objective. And therefore, you don't identify yourself with what you hear. You have to judge what you are hearing and decide what is the correct remedy. So it is not a stressful thing, but it is, it requires, I mean, you get trained to do this, that you are not uh, involved personally in what you are hearing others say. You have to decide correctly about whatever you hear. Decide whether, first of all, what is said is right or wrong. And if it is right, what is what should be done? You can't do that if you are identified with the person. Coming back to your Supreme Court tenure, I think you have delivered more than 200 uh, judgments as a judge of Supreme Court. How was it like to be at that time the only woman judge in the Supreme Court among all the Male brethren. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they were not very used to uh, having a woman judge. So, <laughs> so somebody came and said, please don't come late. And <laughs> somebody else said. <laughs> so I told them, I've been a judge for 20 years. You don't have to tell me all this. <laughs> But they got used to it quite soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you like to give to a young lawyer who is wanting to start practice in this profession? So I would say that you go and listen to a good lawyer arguing a case in court. That is very essential. And uh, the other thing you can say is that uh, don't give up hope. If you are good, ultimately, you will be noticed sooner or later. I think in a city like Bombay, where merit is ultimately recognized. So you should not give up hope and you should continue. I hope that like you, many of our members will accept judgeship when they are called upon to accept judgeship and uh, serve the country by joining the judiciary. Thank you very much, Mrs. Manohar, for your time and your words of wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a rare glimpse into the incredible path-breaking life of Justice Sujata Manohar. You just watched an episode of the Bombay Bar Association podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more such videos. We also have an audio podcast which dives a bit deeper and is available on all the podcast apps.